Hello and welcome to this video on the world's favourite drug, caffeine. You might get your caffeine high from coffee, tea, energy drinks and more. We say high as it is a psychostimulant, but one that is readily available, entirely legal, and has no particular regulations around it. Despite this, it is consumed daily with relatively few incidents of poisoning or long-term harm. Pure caffeine can be found in a crystal state, a white crystal powder with a relatively bitter taste behind it. This is because of its chemical structure and the way it interacts. When purified, it readily congregates, forming these crystals that, chemically, resemble DNA in a manner of speaking. The chemical structure vaguely resembles that of adenine and guanine, two of the DNA and RNA bases. These purine forms can be found in a lot of different organic structures, but that's one that can be easily compared visually. As a foodstuff, caffeine has absolutely no nutritional value, and, in combination with other things, it is relatively tasteless. There's so little of it that you wouldn't know it's there. This is why some medications will also include caffeine, either to improve its longevity or its absorption. Caffeine is naturally occurring in many plants. This is primarily as a poison to protect it from pests. The dose given to a small insect, mold, or similar is enough to kill. That is, enough to kill for an insect. In humans, it is more uncertain, and the results vary between negative and positive. We know it can cause addiction and death if an overdose does occur. Despite this, overdoses are rare and require a considerable amount of the carrier to be consumed. It is more widely used due to its cognitive benefits that allow people to think more clearly, stay awake, and function. As a result of this particularly, the global consumption of caffeine is estimated to be in excess of 120,000 tonnes per year. By far and away the most used drug. Caffeine was isolated as a chemical back in the 1800s. Since then, we've begun to understand how and why it works the way it does. It's been identified that caffeine interferes as an antagonist with the adenosine receptors in the brain. This prevents the adenosine receptors being slowed down, and therefore the brain continues to function. This obviously has an effect on keeping you feeling more awake and active, even if that's not necessarily the case. Over time, we were gradually able to figure out exactly how it works in the brain, or specifically the central nervous system, which does cover the spinal cord as well, but the primary organ of focus is going to be the brain, where it interferes with the adenosine A to A receptor. This was identified using mouse studies, where they took out the various adenosine receptors, trying to figure out which ones were responsible for the mice being more cognitively active and aware of their environment. Gradually, through this knockout experiment, they could isolate it to that specific A2A receptor. Knowing this, you can now begin to look at where it could else it could have an effect in the brain. This could be useful in either A, figuring out what its dependencies are, B, trying to figure out how to treat overdoses, and see if there are any possible damages or extra benefits that are being identified. That's particularly useful when we're looking at that last one if you want to examine things like overdose. We'll touch more on that later on, but for now just understand there is one specific receptor that is targeted by caffeine in the brain. Knowing that, we need to figure out what parts of the brain are most populated by this receptor. It turns out the medullary vagal, the vasomotor, respiratory centers, and a few others are particularly largely populated with this receptor. That would explain some of the greater sense of awareness and psychoactivity of this drug. A sudden increase in heart rate and breathing would give a sudden flush of oxygen to the brain, and as a result, it would be able to kickstart its metabolism just a little bit 
Then there's the effect it has on neurotransmitter release, particularly the monoamines and acetylcholine. Caffeine is considered a stimulant, and like other stimulants, it makes the neurons more capable of releasing their signals and carrying one. It lowers the threshold for the pulse that's needed to pass on a signal. As a result, stimulating the central nervous system allows the brain to communicate more efficiently. Of course, this can also interfere with neurons that aren't in the brain. The reason it works so great is because it is both a water and lipid soluble compound. That means it can pass through cell membranes easily, but more importantly, it can get through the blood brain barrier. Now, normally, things don't get through this barrier very easily, they're not meant to. The human body protects the brain with a large number of safeguards that are designed to prevent drugs from getting into it. These safeguards also exist in the developing embryo. But for now, let's just look at the brain. Because caffeine is very similar to both adenosine and some of the DNA molecules, it's capable of getting through the cell. The first method it uses is those adenosine receptors. But as it passes through them, it uses them as a gateway, but it doesn't activate them. Therefore, it binds to them, occupies them, and then adenosine can't get in there. And because adenosine has a role to play in the brain and the cells within it, beginning to wind down and tire after being active for a long time, preventing adenosine from getting in there means there's a competitive inhibition of the receptor's activity. This means the brain continues to think it's more active and less fatigued than it really is. This is one of the reasons why it's used so extensively. There is a trope of high-flying executives drinking coffee by the gallon in order to maintain their productivity. This is one of the things you need to be aware of when it comes to caffeine. It has good and a bad side. In some cases, it can be used to treat infants who are having breathing difficulties, remembering that it plays on parts of the brain that are useful in allowing the body to stimulate breathing activity and blood flow. If you have a premature child who doesn't have a fully developed lung set, and may not necessarily have a developed heart, increasing heart rate and breathing would allow them to pass more oxygen around the body. There's also an argument that it provides other protective benefits, such as for the liver, where it's said to avoid some of the issues of liver disease. These are benefits found in moderation, and that would be two cups of coffee or less a day. The trope of the high-flying executive does not consume two cups of coffee a day, and the protective benefits of that kind of usage are significantly undone by what is likely dependency. Dependency being otherwise known as addiction, and addicts rarely are particularly productive. Then again, there is the argument of that it's not an addiction, it's substance abuse, but uh, we'll leave that for another day. There is an issue with caffeine, like any drug, that you can develop tolerance, and therefore you need to increase the amount that you consume. There are ways around this, and consuming caffeine within certain time frames can to a certain extent mitigate it, but there are reasons to and not use caffeine. Some people choose to abstain for medical reasons and religious reasons, others simply choose to do so for personal choice. On the whole, it is entirely subjective, but from a medical and clinical perspective, caffeine does have a role to play. Not necessarily caffeine itself, but more likely caffeine citrate, which is considered an essential medicine. As said, it can be used for infants to help resolve some of their breathing difficulties, especially if they are premature. In some cases, it also helps with infants gaining weight. There are other diseases, especially in the newborn, that it's commonly found a role with. It does have some concerns, especially when you're talking about it in a beverage, where you're not just consuming the caffeine itself. There was thought for some time that caffeine might have been the reason why some people, upon drinking coffee, suddenly need to use the bathroom. Ongoing research into that has identified that this occurs even with decaffeinated coffee, 
so it's likely the coffee itself and not the caffeine. Not only is it used to treat infants and young people, but some drugs, such as paracetamol, or as you may also know it, acetaminophen, have caffeine added to it. This is meant to improve its absorption rate. This can increase from between 5 and 10%. As far as the brain is concerned, caffeine's not necessarily the best tool. This owes to the fact that it makes you feel more alert and somewhat improves reaction times. But it's not necessarily going to demonstrate the same benefits when it comes to learning and memory. There are some ways you can assist in memorizing things with caffeine, particularly those that are involved in either a learned reaction or learned training, such as smells being associated with certain topics. But overall, consumption of caffeine by itself does not improve memory or learning abilities. When you're looking at its improvement to cognitive function, the best benefits occur about an hour after consumption, and only at moderate doses. This will last for three to four hours, and then it will wear off. Overall, caffeine has a half-life, and that's about twice that length of time. So halfway through your dose, you begin to see a deteriorating effect, which makes sense. But we'll explain more on the caffeine half-life later. The downside to this improved cognitive functioning is that it can prevent you from sleeping. Caffeine is well known for this problem, and it's therefore used for those who are trying to stay awake. This is beneficial, but due to that half-life, the length of time you may stay awake could be a longer period than you've anticipated. In other cases, caffeine is not just used to stay awake, but to improve physical performance. Generally speaking, we're not talking about weightlifting or particularly muscle-based exercises, rather those that involve endurance, like aerobics and running. This owes again to the way caffeine affects the brain, and then the heart and lungs in particular. It's found to improve running performance at a very low dose, much lower than a standing cup of coffee would contain. It then has an effect on the nature of muscle fatigue and central fatigue, which is beneficial if you are looking to maintain your performance for longer. There has been some evidence showing that it might play a role in those who are trying to develop muscular mass. Although this evidence is severely limited, it doesn't seem to have any concrete proof that when those who are trying to exercise until they drop can actually do any better than without caffeine. There is some limited evidence that if you were to consume caffeine before trying to exercise on a regular basis, such as continuing repetitions, but not until you get exhausted, you may show more relief or think you've done better and come away feeling better than if you had not consumed the caffeine. This may be a combination of being mentally more aware, but also having been physically active which with the two synergistic effects would improve cognitive awareness but not necessarily alter the physical fatigue. These are most of the benefits that are relevant to caffeine. Although we could continue on with them, it seems like a mute point. Now on to the negative effects of caffeine, and caffeine is not without problems. As mentioned, for some people it can cause a sort of spontaneous diarrhea and this is not a particularly enjoyable experience for those who have it. It can also cause asthma-like symptoms in those who have asthma. This can occur up to four hours after consuming a caffeine-based beverage. That time delay can be a concern, especially when you're looking at who would be at most risk of it. Then there are concerns that caffeine might have an effect on bone density leading to a decreased bone density in postmenopausal women. Another concern for the elderly in particular is that caffeine in higher doses does have a mild diuretic effect. At low doses, such as in a standard cup of coffee, isn't going to be a concern, but strong coffee in the range of 200 to 300 milligrams can lead to an increase in urine excretion. 
This can also be exacerbated by those who have been detoxing or otherwise engaging in a diet that forgoes caffeine. As far as psychiatric conditions are concerned, caffeine can have a mild relationship where it is more closely related to those who have an increased experience of anxiety and panic disorders, thereby worsening their condition. In other studies, it seems to help with depression. Unfortunately, there's no clear-cut relationship between psych disorders in general and caffeine. The only well-known and diagnosed or at least specified part of this in the DSM-5 is that caffeine has an induced anxiety disorder attached to it. That is under the substance or medication-induced anxiety disorder categories, which Overall, considering its wide use of base, is not a particularly helpful description of its role. More clear-cut than psychiatric disorders is whether or not caffeine can actually be diagnosed as an addiction. In general, caffeine addiction isn't a recognised diagnosis, although there are some classifications that will provide that particular definition, these being the ICDM-9 and ICD-10. These are generally quite hard to apply simply because caffeine consumption is largely self-regulated by individuals. Further to that, caffeine doesn't appear to reinforce its own usage, and if people begin to consume too much, they may self-limit. This prevents overdosing on it and long-term use quantities that can cause harm. Finally, there's a problem in finding a biological mechanism for that addiction to occur. With drugs like cocaine and amphetamines, we know how the brain is releasing certain neurotransmitters and that these create a positive feedback loop. We don't find that so easily with caffeine. And this is why some of the ICDM-9 and ICD-10 definitions for an addiction diagnosis are contested. If that uncertainty wasn't unhelpful enough for you, the protective benefits of caffeine are not well known either. As mentioned earlier, there's some thought it might play a role in protecting the liver from damage, but then there is other evidence that it could perhaps aggravate certain conditions. There's been relatively little definitive evidence, as caffeine seems to be part of a larger diet and lifestyle figure. The only clear-cut relationship at the moment is that if you have glaucoma, it can increase pressure in the eye, but not if you are an otherwise healthy individual, which is a very niche category. Having looked at the role it plays in both pathologies and healthy individuals to both help and treat things, we now need to look at what an average dose of caffeine actually is. A high dose regime is considered between 1 and 1.5 grams per day. 1 gram being 1,000 micrograms. This is normally associated with a number of other symptoms, particularly psychiatric ones such as nervousness and insomnia. In order to get to that point, you have to consume a lot of coffee. The average cup of coffee has between 80 and 100 milligrams of caffeine per shot. This means your double shot espresso would have 160 to 200 milligrams of caffeine, or one fifth to roughly one seventh the daily allowance. In children, it's a significantly lower threshold, where up to one gram of caffeine can be consumed and that can cause poisoning. On a weight to weight basis, tea leaves will contain more caffeine than coffee. But then again, the average serving of tea in a tea bag or similar is significantly less than the weight of coffee. This means on average, you get less caffeine out of a cup of tea. What may or may not surprise you to learn is that something like cocoa and chocolate contains a small amount of caffeine. Admittedly, a small bar of chocolate or similar would have an equal amount of caffeine in it as decaffeinated coffee but this increases with the complexion of the chocolate. Going from milk chocolate through to dark chocolate, you can find that that amount of caffeine increases considerably. 
For example, dark chocolate has between 80 and 160 milligrams of caffeine per 100 grams of chocolate. While talking about this, we should mention the relationship between caffeine and alcohol. And yes, there is one. Caffeine has shown a rather obvious improvement in your cognitive performance. Alcohol is a depressant and has the opposite effect. It also removes inhibition and similar concerns. When you combine the two, you get the caffeine effect and the alcohol effect, although the caffeine effect is substantially reduced. So at least temporarily, you feel more aware and that you are making the right decision, while alcohol leads you to have rose-tinted glasses. When you consume caffeine, especially from coffee and other beverages, it's primarily absorbed in the small intestine. This is why you need to wait between 30 and 60 minutes for caffeine to begin to have its effect on the body. From here, it passes through the liver to the heart and then is distributed throughout the body. No specific tissue is targeted by caffeine. It just happens that the brain has more receptors through which it can pass. Remembering it is both water and lipid soluble and can find its way into most cells eventually if the concentration is high enough. This is one reason why the highest level of caffeine concentration in the blood plasma is achieved up to two hours after first consumption. It is then removed gradually by the liver going through the blood and filtering it out, placing it into the appropriate carrier molecules and sending it off to be excreted. We mentioned early on that caffeine had a half-life, and this is something important to remember, especially when we're talking about overdoses. It can take between 3 and 7 hours for a half-life to occur. That means every 3 to 7 hours the amount of caffeine in your body is halved. That means coffee consumed in the morning may still have caffeine in the body at the end of the night. Interestingly, caffeine consumption does have a relationship with smoking, but smoking tobacco has a, an effect on caffeine clearance. It can reduce the half-life by 30 to 50%, but oral contraceptives can double the half-life. This means the two behaviours mentioned have completely opposite effects on the way caffeine hangs around the body. This then has an effect on how you're going to be dealt with if, for instance, an overdose occurs. Overall, as was mentioned at the very beginning, caffeine, for being so widely used and so unregulated, has shown remarkably few negative effects. There are limited examples of overdose, and most of those are associated with using it as something other than what's intended as, part of a larger beverage. This could be as something like a sports or physical activity stimulant. It does have a close relationship with behaviours and risk factors that are considered negative and closely related to adverse events like cardiovascular disease. Nonetheless, for such a widely used drug, there are relatively few effects that are negatively associated with it, and for the most part, people seem to enjoy their consumption of it. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.